I want to welcome you to the regular meeting of the Economic Development Committee of the uh, Los Angeles City Council, I'm joined by my colleague Joe Busciano um, and our colleague Jose Rizar uh, has a, uh, a medical issue and not, will not be able to join us this afternoon, but we're ready to get started. Joe, are you? Yes, sir, but before we do, Mr. Chairman, it's a special day in the CD15 family. Laura Hill, my alleged deputy, I'm going to embarrass her. It's her birthday, and she's here at work, committed, dedicated, which I failed to mention in council today. But thank you, Laura, for all that you do for our city and our council district. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Okay, we'll take, uh, we'll call the meeting to order and uh, take general public comment. And it looks like we've got... No general public comment, so we'll close the uh, general comment period, and uh, we'll open the multiple agenda public comment period. It looks like we've got a couple of cards. No multiple. No. Okay. Great. So we will uh, close the uh, multiple agenda public comment period as well. Um, members uh, or member. I should say, uh, with uh, no objection, I'd like to take item five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten on consent. Move the item. Objection. That will be the order. Which takes us where, Mr. Clerk? Um, that would take us to item number one, Mr. Chair. Okay, would you care to read that, please? Um, item number one is a report from the council president relative to the appointment of Ms. Yun-Suk, Sarah Wu to the Industrial Development Authority. Okay, Ms. Yun-Suk, would you please join us? Very happy that you stepped up to the plate, your willingness to serve. Just have a seat. And why don't you uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and why you want to be a member of the Industrial Development authority and what you hope to achieve. Uh, yeah, I try, uh, I want Here, pull it closer. To, yes, uh, I want to service the community and for all my efforts. Mm -hmm. what, what other activities have you, have you uh, participated in that, uh, that you've enjoyed and that you look forward to working yeah, with, uh, with issues? I was on the uh, credit services uh, and uh, finance uh, doing businesses and help the Korean Americans and Latin Americans and try to help them to get a better job. Mm -hmm. Also, I was doing the, uh, the, some developments and uh, um, also the, the, at the Mart industry. And running business with, uh, and I love to uh, service the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we know that your business background would be very helpful. Um, and uh, have you had an opportunity to um, look at some of the issues that come before the Industrial Development Authority yet? What, what, do, you, what do you think are going to be some uh, important issues for you to follow up? That's okay. Let, let me ask you a different way. Let me ask you a different way. Uh, we know the Industrial Development Authority is, is important for our city's uh, growth. What do you hope to see this authority do? Um, try to increase the better job for the communities and, mm -hmm. and just develop the just community areas. So. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, all that is desperately needed, so we appreciate your, your willingness to serve. Uh, Mr. Busciano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I see here in your, your bio uh, you have been instrumental in bringing investment to our city, particularly with the main wholesale mart, which is an apparel wholesale mart um, located in downtown's central appar apparel district. 30 showrooms and... Um, I also re read here that you currently manage America Realty Inc. and um, have strong ties to the Asian markets, uh, which is uh, very instrumental in we're moving forward in our city. Spe spe 
particularly in, in the trade market and both the port and airport. Um, also like the fact that you are very active in community affairs within the Asian American community in our city and um, really appreciate your dedication in serving in this role and looking forward to um, working alongside you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, unless you've got something else to share, I think uh, we're prepared to uh, recommend the appointment to the full council. And do we know when that's going to be going before the council? I believe we should have it um, next week. Would that be fine? Yes, that'll be very fine. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for your service. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. Next item, Mr. Clerk. Item number two is um, our re reports from the Economic and Workforce Development um, Department and the Chief Legislative Analyst relative to the Enhanced Infrastructure Financing District Establishment Policy, and this has also been referred to the Budget and Finance Committee. Okay, well, can we get a staff report on this? This is a, uh, a, uh, a vehicle that uh, we've been looking at uh, since it was... Uh, since it was established, uh, many districts already have taken some steps to see uh, how this program can be leveraged to uh, facilitate economic development in their areas. And so uh, why, don't, uh, why don't we see what the analysis so far has provided? Who's up first? This is Sam Hughes, Economic Workforce Development Department, and um, joined by John Wickham and Dora Warto with the CLA. And uh, several months ago, actually about a year ago, EWDD presented a draft uh, establishment and investment policy for EIFDs. And as I recall, I think the CLA was re requested to report back on that. And today, uh, the CLA is here to report back, and EWDD is here to support that which will be presented. Okay. Good afternoon, Dora Huerta with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, the report before you responds, uh, as Sam indicated, to this committee's request uh, for our office to review EWDD's uh, EIFD establishment policy. Um, in an earlier report, our office recommended that an establishment policy be adopted um, citywide to ensure that the process through which EIFDs would be established was consistent and uniform throughout the city. Um, in preparing this report, we also describe recent actions at the county and state level that impact the proposed citywide policy. Specifically, subsequent to the committee's action, the County of Los Angeles adopted its own policy for implementation of EIFDs. They outlined their own thresholds and criteria the county would consider when receiving proposals from cities that would want to partner with the county to establish a joint EIFD. These county requirements are outlined in our report, and the county's report is included in its entirety as attachment B. Also in October 2017, AB 1568, which was signed by the governor, amended EIFD law to allow for the creation of neighborhood infill finance and transit improvements, also known as NIFTY districts, which permit the allocation of local sales and use tax revenue to support an EIFD. This report provides a summary of the county's policy and the new changes pursuant to AB 1568. Um, the report also highlights the distinct housing requirements embedded in the county policy and the NIFTY amendment. For context, we include a table that compares the housing requirements under EIFD law, NIFTY, the proposed city policy, the county policy, and other tax increment tools. We highlight that both partnering with the county and forming a NIFTY are both optional, and the city would only be subject to additional requirements if the city elects to move forward with either of these options. Our report concludes that the city could meet the city's threshold requirements, such as minimum share of property tax required, 15 cents that they set as a threshold, as it currently collects closer to 26 cents on the dollar. We note that other items council may wish to consider if partnering with the county, such as establishing mutual agreeable commitment of resources for startup costs, ongoing expenses, and staffing should be considered up front and of great importance early negotiation to ensure that mutually acceptable goals are established. Should council elect to form an EIFD, a resolution of intention would need to be approved. This resolution would establish a public financing authority, a separate legal entity comprised of members of each legislative body and the public that would move forward with preparing an infrastructure financing plan and effectuating the EIFD. Our office recommends that the establishment policy as presented by EWDD be amended, uh, be adopted and as amended in this report. Okay. Anything else? Uh, yeah, just throw in, or if you could describe some of the amendments that we've recommended in sure. our report. Sure, of course. Um, the amendments 
a, a reference the amount of um, contribution of tax increment that the city would contribute in, in forming an EIFD. EIFD uh, EWDD proposed a 50% cap um, on the contribution with exceptions. Um, we recommend that we maintain EWDD's proposed 50% cap, but consider each exception to that 50% on a case-by-case -case basis with additional findings, and that each of those requests be subject to council and mayor approval. And should any of those proposals consider a NIFTI, that they also that analysis also be done with and without a NIFTI. Our second amendment has to do with the process. Uh, EWDD proposed that a request for an EIFD uh, feasibility study be initiated through an email. We recommend that the process um, be initiated through a motion adopted by council. Um, it, it should be noted that the, count, the city can form an EIFD on its own. It does not need the county. The benefit of bringing the county in is that that would add more money to the district. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so the policy in front of you would, basically is in the context of, of the city moving forward on its own um, with the flexibility to adjust um, the, the criteria of the EIFD if we bring the county in because the county's got a little bit more restrictive components in it, right? So um, the, fl the policy kind of provides flexibility to go either path. Um, but to initiate the evaluation process. So there's not a requirement that the county be involved in? Not at all. That was our initial kind of uh, analysis, correct? That we had to have the county as a partner? The, the, benefit, the benefit was bringing in the county because it brought a lot more money in, right? Is that right, Sam? Yep. So um, that, would, that would absolutely be helpful, but the county has um, greater restrictions in the formation process than the city does. And so that's, that's one of the um, you know, cost-benefit analysis elements that would be in front of you when this moves forward. The process is, I believe maybe Sam might be able to explain it a little bit further, but the, the motion kicks off an internal review process uh, that has a couple phases before we get to the formation of the PFA. Formation of the PFA basically creates a new body that- PFA for the listening audience. Public Finance? Public Financing Authority. Authority. And so that's an independent body, and that's when it gets real in terms of being able to, in taking the property tax, setting it aside, deciding what projects get funded. The City Council doesn't decide which projects get funded. The PFA makes those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. And so um, the policy is set up, I believe, and Sam might be able to speak more to it, puts in a good deal of analysis at the front end before the Council passes it off to the PFA. Indeed. Thanks, John. For example, if, if CD9 or CD15 proposes an EIFD, um, there will be a motion. And EWD essentially will prepare a preliminary assessment. And what that preliminary assessment entails includes but isn't limited to determining whether market reports really indicate future growth is expected. And what we're looking to do is look at real estate trends, looking at cap rates, and looking at absorption rates to figure out what's going on in terms of the real estate market, particularly when we're talking about economic development, um, catalytic developments. Um, moreover, we're looking at how fast um, the bonds can be supportable, how quickly can the TI actually support a bond issuance, whether it's $5 million or $50 million. So there are a few things that we're going to do within EWD, uh, within existing staff, uh, to make a preliminary assessment as to whether or not it's feasible to move forward. And I'm using that term feasible quite loosely right now because only subsequent um, to our analysis will um, the particular um, request be sent back to the council office, strike that, to the council and the mayor for approval. And at that point, to John and Dora's point, um, we then will proceed in likely engaging a third party to do a more comprehensive <coughs> feasibility analysis as we take the necessary steps to um, move forward with the resolution of intent and then setting up the PFA and all the other necessary legal documents and frameworks so we can move this forward. Mm -hmm. We know that the um, um, enhanced infrastructure financing districts are relatively new. Uh, any other cities been able to take advantage of them yet? Any examples of other? It is new. And um, West Sacramento has established an EIFD. And most recently, I believe within the last five months or so, the city of Laverne, which is in East Los Angeles County, uh, established an EIFD. What I understand in the case of Laverne, uh, that EIFD is 
just a city EIFD, if you will, whereby the county has not agreed to participate. Um, but the EIFD is established nonetheless. This is this is. And then how about Sacramento? Have they actually done any deals yet? Sacramento? Yes. It was. It's you established. Know. I don't know the details about that one. I guess Dora mm -hmm. can speak yes, to that. Um, there are three cities to date that have established EIFDs. Um, Sam's correct. The uh, city of West Sacramento, uh, city of Laverne, and Otay Mesa. Um, and all three of them are acting alone uh, without county participation. So they formed EIFDs. Cities. And, and they all seem to be relatively small uh, municipalities, too. Do they, does, does this vehicle seem to be better suited for a smaller city than a larger? Or it just depends. I think it's going to depend. And, you know, with the big, we're not going to do the entire city of Los Angeles right. as an EIFD. We would, you know, select a smaller second. areas. So it might be equivalent in that way. Um, and West City of West Sacramento is unique in that they receive an extremely large amount of the property tax. They, it's something like 40, 45 percent of the property tax in that county goes to the city. So it's very different than us. When we're down at 26 percent, and we're high in Los Angeles County. There are a number of cities in LA County that are less than 15 percent. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, an important part of this process is a uh, is the study. Uh, that has to be done. Um, so who's going to do the study? How much is it going to cost? Um, who's going to pay for it? How, how is that going to work? Great questions. Again, the preliminary assessment that EWD will conduct, essentially, uh, EWD will absorb that. We have current staff uh, to do the assessment as I've articulated. Um, as we start to ramp up, and depending on the number of EIFDs that are presented, and just, just how rapid the, the the PFAs are set up and the capacity of the same will determine just how much um, EWD will need to work with the PFA before it and the PFA actually has its staff to do the necessary administrative work um, in order to fulfill whatever obligations that might come as a result of establishing an EIFD. As we shift gears to the full-blown comprehensive feasibility study that was mentioned earlier, at that point, uh, certainly there will be um, dollars that will be necessary to help underwrite the cost of the feasibility analysis. Um, that can range anywhere from 20000 to maybe forty-five dollars or $50,000 for that comprehensive feasibility analysis, which takes into account virtually any and all scenarios and hypotheticals that one might consider, not the least of all, considering the county's share, if any. Um, if, in fact, it's something less than 50 percent, um, it's evaluating that and certainly measuring that in comparison to the city's contribution, contribution as proposed. Mm -hmm. And so um, definitely at that point, you know, additional funds will need to be um, identify in order to bankroll, if you will, the cost of that third-party evaluator. And, and do we think we have a list of uh, consultants that we can draw upon to do these studies once they... Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, we do. Proposed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, we do. Um, certainly EWD, about two years ago, we released a request for qualifications uh, to the financial advisory community, if you will, and we still have that list. It's still viable, and it was upon that list that we drew upon to to help us come up with the citywide establishment and investment um, policy for EIFDs. And there's one particular council office that um, wanted to move forward with a feasibility study. And we identified yet another um, consultant that assisted us in that regard. So thankfully, not only is EWD relatively well staffed to do its preliminary assessment, but the city has at its disposable, at, as its disposal, um, other consultants that um, are well equipped to look out for the best interests of the city. Mm -hmm. There was some reference earlier to the uh, PFA. Uh, I forgot exactly what that stands for. Public Finance Authority. Public Finance Authority, Finance Authority. Yeah. right. But the question is, who appoints that board? That, that was my question. Who appoints that board? And Actually, I was, just, I was just going to recommend to the committee that you um, provide another instruction to staff to report back on the PFA formation. Uh, state law is clear that there each each um, governmental body that's on the PFA, so if it's just the city of Los Angeles, it's just the city of LA, or uh, there are five members from the city of LA. Three of them are elected officials, officials from, the, from the legislative body, so in that case, three members from the Los Angeles City Council, and then two members from the public. Uh, which is fine. If the county joins us, then they would also get five. Right. 
<laughs> right? Which, which becomes a complicating factor because there are five supervisors. If three supervisors are on every PFA that's formed in the County of Los Angeles, they're going to be going to EIFD PFA meetings all day long. Um, so I think we're going to see that the County Board of Supervisors is going to have some limitations. Um, but that being said, uh, if the committee would like to instruct uh, CLA and EWDD to report back on recommendations for the appointment process to the PFA, we would be able to do, there's some research we need to do to confirm um, some of the details in the state law and how that interacts with uh, the city's appointment authorities. Uh, for example, the state law is not clear on whether the public members are required or not to live in the district that's being formed or have some you know stake in the district and, and the council may want that so we need to be, we need to do a little more research to determine whether we can put those kinds of um, obligations or requirements in the appointment process okay good Mr. Buscano, any questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I truly feel that with the demise of the CRA, not only here in the state, but nationally, um, I've learned through my involvement with NLC that cities across the country, including ours, are um, really turning to this new finance financial model to really spark more economic development. Um, I do know locally, uh, in, in talking to my colleague on the county board, uh, Janice Hahn, Supervisor Hahn, um, very supportive of the Redondo Beach EFID uh, with the recent purchase uh, in that city of the AES power plant. And they are in the process. That's something that we can kind of track um, on best practices and lessons learned. And I am really excited of the fact that I know we've talked about studies and looking at specific areas, project areas in our, in our, in our city. Uh, I partnered with SCAG. I don't know, John, if you're aware of this, but SCAG um, helped fund a number of these EFID studies across the region, and my, my district was one of them, the, the waterfront communities of Wilmington and San Pedro. And we have learned that we definitely need the county on board um, to really um, hone in and take advantage of these these dollars that can be filtered back into the, the waterfront communities. So um, just note that we... I know it's not a red light, green light thing. It's just a partnership with, with uh, Janice's office. It's something that if, if you can really track and, and help us along with Allison and Nate in my office. But uh, we um, are excited to move forward on an EIF, EIFD because we know that as we, we're creating an innovation district that we'll really um, take advantage of this opportunity. Um, question? Is that uh, you know there's going to be may some may have some concerns with our colleagues, especially with the budget and finance committee that you know these are going to be dollars that are uh, be taken away from from our our city funds. Uh, have, are we aware of that? Um, how do we address some of those concerns from our colleagues? I, like I'm all in. If we're going to reinvest into our respective districts, you got a yes vote here. But how, how are you are you prepared to address some of those concerns from our colleagues? Yes. The short answer is yes, and that's a part of the, the analysis, the comprehensive analysis that will be done um, by a third party in conjunction with EWD. Not so much a part of the initial preliminary assessment, mm -hmm. but particularly with respect to the comprehensive study, because in short, there is the but-for test. If you've got, for example, vacant city-owned property that's not generating anything in the way of right. uh, tax increment, then it might th – there's nothing lost for the city because it's not getting anything. Now, if it can be demonstrated that a bond should be issued against future tax increment, if, in fact, a district is established and the development at this particular site wouldn't happen but for mm -hmm. some monies, then therein lies, I think, the argument to move forward in likely establishing an yeah. EIFD. But they're on case-by-case -case basis, and, and um, we're ready, as appropriate, to address those questions and concerns yeah. Um, as they'll likely be presented, not only by the council, but these are questions that EWD has uh, when it's starting to examine um, the feasibility, if you will, of, mm -hmm. of establishing an EIFD. And I know in CD9, it's a uh, lesson learned. I know you've assembled some properties current on, in your districts that now owned by the, by, the, by the city that you can take advantage of this. The question I had also on page two of the um, policy here uh, of attachment A, um, Middle of the page, um, 
so leveraging of city-owned property, uh, would the EIFD include underutilized city-owned property? Even city-owned property that is utilized, I mean, if it sits on a prime location for, in my case, Wilmington or San Pedro on waterfront property, I mean, that's, we can really maximize and look at the best and highest use of, of these specific city-owned properties, like the beautiful parking lot that oversees a new development along the new San Pedro public market. So I, I'm just a little concerned about why it's underutilized. Is it, why does it have to be underutilized? Or doesn't? That includes underutilized. Oh, includes. Not, okay, not, gotcha. Yeah, it's, it's oh, gotcha. Oh, there's... Okay, yeah, it's not understood. excluding anything. Got um, it. But certainly, you know, on the one hand, there's the argument for project-specific EIFDs. But when we consider the county and its willingness to participate, yeah. uh, generally larger than just a project mm -hmm. will be required to establish the EIFD, yeah. um, not to mention the legislative... Um, body that will need to be established to move forward and administer and otherwise yeah. sort of be the overseer of, the, of this authority to, to administer the funds. So, um, but certainly in this case, it, it includes underutilized, but that's not to the exclusion of anything that's not otherwise underutilized. Opportunities here. Uh, I also, I know I'm talking waterfront, but in Watts, we're looking at Central Avenue and mm -hmm. looking at the, the plan of moving forward and working with WLCAC. I know they can take advantage of this these um, finance districts so let's move on I know we've heard this before in committee but now with some of the amendments from the state I'm look happy uh, to move on it all right good anything else so Thank we you. would ask uh, if you move forward to adopt the CLA report with the amendment to have uh, report staff back. report back okay we'll do that I think we've got uh, public comment though from Antonio Hicks before we do that so mr. Hicks please join us Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Antonio Hicks, and I'm a senior staff attorney for uh, public counsel. Um, thank you for this opportunity. Um, so our overarching concern about the establishment policy is that it should memorialize the city's commitment to preventing displacement and advancing affordable housing and economic mobility opportunities. Um, so you may have noticed attached to the uh, staff report, uh, attachment B, I think, is the county's establishment policy. We'd like to see the city go uh, beyond uh, even what the county has included in their policy. So let me just quickly run down the type of things that we would urge the, this committee to include in a, in a uh, uh, EIFD establishment policy. So one would be to dedicate a significant percentage of tax increment uh, to affordable housing, and we recommend at least... 25%, uh, which is consistent with the former redevelopment agency's uh, City of LA's policy. Uh, also, to apply uh, replacement housing provisions to all development within the district. Um, require inclusionary housing production within the district. And again, these are, these are all things that can be done now uh, legally. So, um, well, I guess that's it for now. Uh, I'll, I'll finish your thought. Okay, thank you. Well, there was just a couple more things, which uh, most importantly is for the establishment policy to create a process for meaningful community engagement in the development and implement implementation of the infrastructure finance plan. So again, uh, really getting that community buy-in is going to help avoid the NIMBYs and, and, and move those projects forward. Um, dedicate financing to protect and support community serving small businesses. Uh, encourage local and targeted hiring for EIFD projects. And finally, uh, uh, to conduct an assessment of the impacts of EIFD projects on low-income communities. Thank you. And thank you very much. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All good comments. Uh, I want to thank you for your comments. I want to thank staff for the uh, presentation uh, and, and councilman for your questions uh, yep. that went along with that. Uh, without objection, we're going to move to approve the CLA report uh, recommendations with the amendments uh, and a report back on recommendations for uh, the uh, the approval process for the PFA. I think that covers it, right? Okay, great. Any objections? That will be the order. Thank you. Next item. Item number three is our reports from the Economic Development, uh, Economic and Workforce Development Department and the City Administrative Officer relative to reconstitution of the U United States Department of Commerce, Economic Development. Administrative Revolving Loan Fund Program. All right, come on down. Revolving Loan Fund. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Shafi Amir from the CAO's office. Daisy Hernandez with Economic and Workforce Development. Uh, so the CAO the report before you is regarding EWD's request for approval to execute 
a grant ag amendment agreement with the U.S. EDA Economic Development Administration to consolidate two previous EDA revolving loan fund awards into one single award and to commit to reestablishing the revolving loan fund program for businesses within EWDD using funding received as a result of a legal settlement related to the previous defunct RLF program and city general funds. EWDD also requests approval for the transfer of current year unappropriated balance funds in the amount of 1.2 million which were budgeted for the EDA grant obligation in the current year. Our, our report is recommending approval of EWDD's requests while recommending that their expenditure authority over the transferred UB funds be withheld until the preconditions of the RLF program are met, including a grant administration plan, <coughs> excuse me, approved by the EDA council and mayor. Based on the negotiations between the mayor's office and the EDA, the city um, has an obligation under the previous EDA RLF agreements for grant awards which were received by the mayor's office through the 1990s. The subcontractor who had been contracted by the mayor's office uh, during that time eventually became non-compliant with grant reporting and other requirements. The EDA approached the previous mayor's administration um, for a resolution regarding the city's non-compliance, uh, which had been outstanding since the 1990s. In 2015, uh, the city received 933000 through a legal settlement with the former su uh, subcontractor for previous grant awards. Through negotiations uh, between the mayor and the EDA, the total obligation um, is $4.6 million for those two uh, previous awards to be consolidated into one. So with the offset of the 933000 out off of the $4.6 million, that leaves the city to provide the balance of $3.7 million. Um, and it was negotiated to provide that over a three-year period, the $3.7 million. Uh, of the $1.2 million that's budgeted in the current year UB budget and requested for transfer in the report before you, EWD states, um, of, of that, sorry, excuse me, of that, the $1.2 million is the first uh, kind of installment of the city providing that funding. And EWD states that it will not begin implementation of the program um, until certain conditions have been met, um, which include a grant administration plan, which is forthcoming um, with EDA council and mayor approval. And EDA is work, has worked with a consultant on drafting that plan and will report back to council for approval for that. So that's still required before they can actually start implementation. Mm -hmm. So to summarize, um, <clears throat> kind of all over the place, but our office is recommending approval of the authority for EWD to execute the grant agreement, which would then commit the city to reconstitute this revolving loan fund program and for the transfer and to approve transfer of the $1.2 million in the UB funds for EWDD. Um, our report is also recommending withholding EWDD's expenditure authority of the UB funds until the following three conditions have been met. Execution of the grant amendment agreement, which would be authorized with approval of this report, um, approval by the EDA Council and Mayor of Grant Administration Plan, which is forthcoming and not in the current report, and a total funding base of about $2.8 million for the capital base for the RLF. And this $2.8 million capital base is required by the EDA's RLF. Um, and, and of that 2.8, how much is available now? How much do we have so, now? So currently they have nine, the 933000 uh, that they received as part of the settlement. That's already that's being held by EWDD. And then this report is asking for the transfer of the $1.2 So it would be the one point two plus the 933 But that still leaves them short. That still requires them to have the next year's funding um, to reach the $2.8 So they can't start until that funding has been transferred to them for the 1819, which it was included in the budget um, in the UB, the, the next installment, the 1.2 million in the 1819 UB. Just to kind of step back for a minute and give us a, a kind of a big picture on um, the kinds of activities that the revolving loan fund uh, can fund. What's, what's the... Well, these are business loans, uh, and this would be to supplement the, the other programs that we already have and that we're already implementing. So this is just to add to the, to the uh, different types of assistance and access to capital to the businesses in the city. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that uh, this is reestablishing a, a program that it, had it operated previously. What's the difference between what's being proposed now and the revolving loan fund that existed? 
Well, this is basically the same program. We're just restarting it, reinstating it. Um, so it would be providing the same type of assistance, access access to capital for operating expenses for you know for small businesses. Mm -hmm. So it's it's in essence the same program. It, this time we are going to be we're going to have oversight and management of the program. So we're okay. same wine, different bottle now. Huh? Exactly, okay. and we'll remain within compliance. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Buciano, any questions? Yeah, at what point can we anticipate the federal government chipping into this program? <laughs> okay. I mean, I mean, again, I'm just putting on my CD15 hat. We've been very helpful. EDAs come in with our $3 million grant for the um, the Alta C dock repair work there. It's been, they've been instrumental, but really have not seen much come through. Okay, so we continue to look for opportunities to, to seek um, more funding from different agencies, including the EDA. At this time, for this program, though, there's not going to be any new EDA money uh, at this time, at least so as we reconstitute it. Hopefully, in the future, we'll have an opportunity to apply for more funding. So, uh, let me just understand. So, the fund is not going to be activated until next year. Is that correct? Right, until we have the $2.8 in place. Mm -hmm. And what are our, our consultants doing in D.C. to advocate for these dollars? We know are we talking to them. Um, I believe the mayor's office has been yeah. um, actively um, in negotiations with with okay. EDA. Yes. And before I turn it over to Steve Andrews, I just wanted to clarify that the the subject of this report in EWD's transmittal is to rectify the two previous uh, grant awards that had been awarded to the city and then basically were lost and they lost track of it and could not provide any kind of information to EDA regarding what happened to the funds. So the purpose of this um, is really to kind of rectify the way EDA sees it as these funds are still somewhere, supposed to be in the city, yeah. right? But, sorry, oh, sure. and then, um, so for further, it, like as far as the, the way that it's been negotiated, and Steve Andrews can speak to that because he, the see. mayor's office did speak with them. <clears throat> Steve Andrews, mayor's office of economic development. Um, the reality of this situation is that the original grants that were provided to the city stayed operational for some years. They were then farmed out to a nonprofit. Uh, there were then grant deficiencies brought to the attention of the mayor. This act program actually started in the uh, in the in the uh, Mayor Bradley administration. It was privatized mm -hmm. in the Reardon administration. It went marching on along. So, in reality, uh, the grant deficiency. We are non-compliant with the original grant provided. EDA is allowing us to keep $2.8 million as opposed to refunding it to the federal government and allowing us to reconstitute providing the matching funds that have been lost. Mm -hmm. So in reality, uh, we've, we've struck a deal here, honestly, that allows us to keep right. it here. Consider it. Right, right, right. Sorry, and, and to just reiterate a point that was brought to our attention, um, it's not reflected this way in the CA report, but the 933000 that was recovered from the subcontractor um, is considered EDA funds. Um, obviously, it was recovered, you know, and, this, and the, the, as Steve said, that the city is allowed, being allowed to keep it to reconstitute the program. That's part of the um, agreement. But that would constitute basically EDA funding, but it was recovered. Um, the rest of the funding would come from the city, um, as indicated. Okay. Any other comments? Any questions? Thank you. Yeah. Good. Well, if there are uh, no, uh, no objections, we will, oh, I'm sorry, we do have a, uh, do have a public comment. Thank you. Thank you. And let's call Reverend uh, Clarence Moore up. Reverend Moore. No more? That's a pun, get it? No more? Okay. Not very punny, was it? Oh. Okay. <laughs> Quit while we're here. Uh, okay, Reverend, uh, we'll close the public comment and um, approve the CAO report recommendations as presented and look forward to this program moving forward. Uh, there are no objections. Uh, Mr. Busciano, that's going to be the order. And so it is. Thank you. Next item. And the last item on the, on the agenda is a motion from Council Members Price and Busciano relative to evaluating the proposed hotel project at 3, um, 3900 Figueroa Street and possible economic development incentives. Okay, this is a proposed 
the Room Hotel, 39th and Fig, right across from the new uh, soccer stadium. Uh, we think it's going to be an exciting addition. Uh, we've got um, we've got some public comment. Let's take the public comment, and then we'll take the recommendation. First up, uh, Arian, I'm sorry, Arlene Stahl, Stahli. I apologize for botching the name. Uh, Michael uh, Steinborn, Ellie Correra, Johnny Coleman. Just kind of cue yourselves. Come on up, and it doesn't matter the order. John Cullen and Jim Childs. Those are the names we have for comment on this item. If you, if, if you, I'm sorry, we've got some more names. Yeah, just, just hang tight. I'll make sure you speak. Yes, identify yourself, and, and you've got a minute. Uh, I guess I can go first. Uh, Ariel Soleil. Um, it's not news to anyone in this room that we are in a housing affordability and homelessness crisis. A recent report from the CHP and the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing shows that nearly 600,000 new units are needed in Los Angeles to satisfy the demand of lower income renters. Meanwhile, this very project would demolish eight rent stab stabilized buildings we desperately need for a hotel the Olympics needs 10 years from now. Clearly, we cannot afford to lose more affordable housing in this city, especially as we see more and more Angelinos displaced by the rising cost of housing in gentrifying neighborhoods. We are not in a hotel development crisis, especially in South LA. Please ask yourself, how will the residents displaced by this project actually benefit from it? This proposal makes it clear that the beneficiaries are not current residents, but wealthy visitors, the tourism industry, and real estate developers. Time and time again, and exemplified by the 2028 Olympic bid, we've seen City Hall prioritize the demands of these interests over the concrete needs of our communities. City Hall should not be offering financial incentives and tax subsidies for this project, especially when Measure HHH funds may already fall short of its goal. That's all. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> I'm Michael Steinborn. I'm with DSALA and No Olympics LA. Um, two months ago on Late Night with Seth Meyers, Mayor Garcetti said, I'm confident by the time the Olympics come, we can end homelessness on the streets of LA. I do not see how demolishing RSO units is going to end homelessness. Um, considering we're in a crisis right now, and city council has to hold rallies to try to get people into the idea of shelters, uh, trying to get permanent supportive housing for a decade from now, it just it doesn't seem like this is in the right direction at all. Um, it, in the Homelessness and Poverty Committee, um, Marquise Harris Dawson regularly tells us that we should be in South LA doing work down there and we would actively be mobilizing against this if we were. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Uh, good morning. Jim Childs, West Adams Heritage Association, uh, representing the Coalition of Historic Preservation is including the Conservancy, CPF, NUPCA, Ad Hoc. Uh, we've written extensively to the EIR. Uh, the fact that the city is considering subsidizing the demolition of the California Register at risk by this proposed development as it's now presented is obscene. It is actually obscene to me that the city would consider destroying historic register buildings in order to put up a, quote, hotel, which in its meetings with us was going to be a mid-rise building and spare the demolition of those historic properties. But for whatever reasons, that's been reconfigured so that those buildings are a total loss. On the next block over, a developer is doing construction and respecting those historic properties, and you should do the same with this project. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Ellie Correa, and um, I'm in agreement with the comments that have been made so far. It should embarrass everyone at this table that this proposal is being taken seriously at all. Um, as it's been mentioned already, I believe the CHP has said that the gap between the affordable uh, units that we need in the city and those that exist is about 600,000. There's a housing shortage in this city, not a hotel shortage. And I'm not sure where anyone got that idea outside of the developer's website. Um, this is, we know what happens when we 
get rid of affordable housing and favor developers instead. I live in a gentrifying neighborhood, and what happens is that our neighbors end up on the streets. And so I would urge you to please reject this proposal in the interest of housing our people. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Sean Collin. I live on Vista Del Mar Street in Franklin Village and vote in City Council District 4. I'm here today to voice my concerns about the proposed development. The motion before the committee today mentions the upcoming Olympics as a justification for the conversion of permanent rent stabilized housing for the poor and powerless into temporary luxury housing for the rich and powerful. As the committee knows, Los Angeles is in the midst of housing crisis of epic proportions. Every square inch of land that the city cedes to billionaire developers is one less square inch available to unhoused families, the unemployed, disabled, and elderly. Such displacement is an act of class warfare and a redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich. Public money to use to support wealth redistribution in this way is blood money. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Jim Giles, Inez Al Alcazar, Jed Perriott, uh, Molly Lambert, and Kyle Scott. Um, it is absolutely absurd. Name, sorry, name please. Yes, Jed Perriott uh, with the DSA and, and Olympus. It is absolutely absurd that this is an agenda item, that you are even considering this. Um, as all the speakers have, have mentioned, um, the idea that we would use public funding, public resources for a hotel when Triple H is falling short right now, day by day, while people are dying in the streets, do you guys know that 831 unhoused Angelinos died last year? How many is it going to be this year? How many is it going to be by 2028? 10,000 people dead because they don't have homes? No, this is, this is absurd. Um, I mean, it, it feels like this is an attempt to turn L.A. into this exclusive playground for, for wealthy tourists. Is that really what you're trying to do, Councilmember Price? Or maybe, Councilmember Bruscano, maybe this is what you had mentioned when you spoke about how the Olympics could weed out poverty. Is this what you're talking about here? Because that's what this looks like. And if you really care about the people, you will deny this hotel, you will preserve this housing. And if you don't, um, your jobs are going to be in jeopardy because we're going to vote you out. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ines Alcazar, and I'm a resident of 38th and Flower Drive. I'm also speaking for 39th and Flower Drive uh, tenants. Uh, I have lived over there my entire life. I worked in the community, and um, I raised my children there. And as now I'm uh, disabled and retired, and I'm on fixed income. And uh, basically, uh, half of the tenants over there in that block, they're on, under fixed income, and they're elderly people. Uh, we can barely afford to live there because uh, it's under rent control. So we're very preoccupied of where our future will be, if that is the case. Also, I remember when you were running for councilman, we were very happy to, to give, you, give you our vote because we thought, you know, somebody, we, have, we will have somebody to speak on our behalf. And it's, now I'm very sad to, to see that this is happening. Okay, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. Hi, Molly Lambert. Um, yeah, the, uh, the idea that the community requires any additional hotel rooms for the Olympics is completely absurd. Uh, there are way too many luxury buildings. Most of them are empty. And there are plenty of Airbnbs for those tourists. That should also be illegal. What we don't have in this city is affordable housing for all the unhoused and low-income people that live in Los Angeles who work in all the expensive places that are going to serve those tourists that you care more about than the people who live in Los Angeles, who really care about this city, and you're making your priorities obvious if you place developers' needs over the needs of the people in Los Angeles who are struggling, who are, as Jed said, dying in the streets because those luxury apartments have no bearing on their actual lives on places like Skid Row and downtown LA. So you know, think about it. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Kyle Scott from Los Angeles chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. Um, so we have almost 60,000 people uh, homeless on the streets of LA, 20% increase in homelessness over the past year. 
recent report from the LA Times says that the proposed 10,000 affordable housing units from the Triple H ballot measure is going to come up short by at least 4,000 units, not to mention that the 10,000 is already a drop in the bucket of what the city needs. And here we have a proposal to convert the already meager, in insanely meager supply of affordable housing units into a luxury uh, hotel that's going to service the needs of wealthy tourists from out of the country. Um, Council Member Price, you have on record as saying that this community requires additional hotel rooms to serve these grow growing tourist demands, which in other words means that they require their own displacement at the hands of wealthy tourists that are going to come into their communities who are not a member of these communities and never will be. So I ask you to stand up to these developers to say no and say no to the ongoing displacement and gentrification of these low-income communities. Hi, I'm Johnny Coleman. I'm with No Olympics LA and DSA LA. Um, I'm sorry, Jose Wizar can't be here today, but we'll make sure he personally gets the message. Um, I was really taken aback last fall when everyone was claiming, both in this room and from Garcetti's office, that this would be a no-build Olympics. Here we are. We're talking about a building where it couldn't be more dramatic and blatant. You're taking rent-stabilized apartments in the middle of a historic housing crisis in order to pave the way for wealthy tourists to stay here in 10 years. Um, the, way that you, the way that you serve the developers is very similar to the way that you serve the IOC. These are also wealthy people uh, that do not represent the majority of Angelinos. And I'm just curious who in this room has the courage or conviction to say no to a developer. Is there anyone? I, I didn't think so. Thanks. Okay, any other, uh, any other comments? I will close the uh, public, public comment on this item. Uh, you, you, know, you know, we're always challenged trying to balance, trying to balance the, um, balance the equities. We certainly do need more hotel rooms as we are moving forward, uh, but we also need to provide more affordable housing. This is an interesting project uh, on two parking lots. And in fact, a lot of discussion is made about the hotel that's being proposed. Uh, but there's also a, an affordable housing component uh, and a student housing component. Uh, and these historic properties that uh, there was some reference to are going to be relocated. So I, I think we're, we're, we're trying to um, sort of be sensitive to issues, concerns of re, uh, regentrification, rejuvenation of development, uh, and, we want to, uh, and we want to always achieve some balance. This particular motion uh, calls for the CLA to uh, retain a consultant to evaluate the proposed hotel. It also requires the uh, developer to pay the full cost uh, of this financial analysis, uh, as we've done on projects all around the city. And so um, with that, uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Buscan, unless you have a comment? Well, no, uh, I, I just want, I'm glad that you... Um Recognize in the, the last moving clause that the developer would pay for the full cost of any financial economic analysis, consultants, and the other reviews associated with the economic evaluation of this project. So um, that's the reason why I, I second in this motion as well. And, and we have to compete. Uh, we're, as far as our conventions, and, and clearly the expansion of the, ho the hotels need to be made in order for us to be competitive. We're leaving a lot of money on the table as we're moving forward to be a, a more competitive convention city. Um, so happy to at least look at the feasibility of this moving forward and happy to hear that the, the agreement's been made with the developer to pay full cost recovery. Okay, well, there are uh, no other... Uh... The, 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 the housing crisis in this city is, is, a, is oh. a national shame. I just want to say that. It's no, no, that, no, no. Black eye on our city. You certainly welcome to make that comment. You can... Say as much as you like. We're going to adjourn the meeting, however, uh, at this time, if there's no other business. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. And thank you for your comment.